Hello, everyone, and welcome, uh, and thank you for joining us for this bonus session in our 2021 Climate Action Webinar Series. My name is Bob Murren, FAIA. I'm currently the AIA California Secretary Treasurer, and I'll be your moderator, moder moderator for today's segment. As you know, AIA California has developed an in-depth series focused on understanding and implementing the AIA Framework for Design Excellence. This series will run through the end of this year and will feature monthly hour-long general climate action webinars, as well as 90-minute webinars that dive deeper into technical topics. Additionally, AIA California has partnered with various organizations with like-minded goals to bring us bonus contents to you in the comfort of your own office, wherever you may that may find you. As always, all webinar content and additional resources will be available on the AIA California website shortly after each session. A quick, uh, a few quick housekeeping reminders before we get started. Number one, today's session qualifies for one AIA HSW learning unit for those watching live and AIA California staff will report these units for you. The session's also being recorded and will be posted on the AIA California website with additional resources and a PDF of the presentation shortly after the presentation. And as a reminder, please use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom to ask any questions uh, for, our, for today's presenters. You can also like a question to move it to the top of the queue. On to today's webinar. As I mentioned earlier, AI California has partnered with, with Build with Strength, along with National Ready Mixed Concrete Association, California, Nevada Cement Association, and California Construction and Industrial Materials Association, who have helped make the AI California Action Climate Action webinar series possible. Today's webinar is the third in a three-part mini-series brought to you. In case you missed the first two webinars uh, on the top 10 ways to reduce carbon, uh, concrete's carbon footprint and specifying sustainable concrete, you can find these recordings, a PDF of the slides, and additional resources on the AIA, AIA California website. Today's webinar will focus on the latest innovations in concrete. Concrete is the material of choice for the tallest buildings in the world and infrastructure designed to last centuries. To meet demands for these cutting edge projects, concrete must be stronger, more durable, and more workable than ever before. This session explores how new products, manufacturing methods, and research are developing innovative concretes to meet these new challenges. Bendable concrete, smog eating concrete, and carbon capture are just a few examples of new technologies embracing a product that is nearly 5,000 years in development. I'd like to quickly introduce today's presenters before finally handing it over to them. Lionel LeMay is Executive Vice President, Structures and, Structures and Sustainability for the National Ready Mixed Concrete Association whose uh, initials are NRMCA. He leads a team of professionals to offer building owners and designers cost-effective, durable, and sustainable concrete building solutions through education, research, and design assistance. He has written many articles and books on concrete design and construction. He's a reg registered professional engineer and structural engineer in the state of Illinois. He is also a lead accredited professional. Mr. LeMay holds a bachelor and master's degree in civil engineering from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Our other presenter, Dom Thompson, AIA, is Senior Director, Building Innovations for National Ready Mixed Concrete Association, based in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He supports the Build and Strength Program, demonstrating the first cost and long-term advantages of ready mixed concrete building systems throughout eight Midwest states. He's a licensed architect and, and lead accredited. Don has over 20 years of practical experience in design and construction. More, most recently, he has worked 
for over 22 years in the cement and concrete industry, holding a variety of technical promotion and sales positions. Dom holds a BA and master's in architecture from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Take it away, Lionel and Dom. Thank you very much, Bob. Let me just go ahead and share my screen here and get started. Uh, so like Bob mentioned, the, the topic of our presentation today is concrete innovations. And I would like to thank again, AIA California for hosting this. And uh, of course the co-sponsors, including ourselves and uh, the California Nevada Cement Association and CalSEMA. I also wanna point out that <clears throat> AIA uh, Seattle is a uh, co-promoter of this event. Also Build with Strength, NRMCA and uh, our state affiliate there, Washington Aggregate and Concrete Association is also uh, sponsoring that uh, event. So we probably have a few people from Washington State on the uh, webinar today. Uh, I won't go through these again because we've already gone through them, but uh, they'll be, be there when we uh, uh, print the PDF or download later. Uh, just to make sure that you understand uh, what you're supposed to gather from today's uh, webinar, and hopefully uh, you'll you'll get that uh, at the end. So um, here's the the stating the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, obviously, climate change is uh, affecting our climate. This, uh, California is probably the epicenter of things like uh, wildfires, uh, drought, and so forth. And of course, other parts of the country, we have uh, other weather events like hurricanes and tornadoes that are becoming more frequent and more intense, uh, uh, all caused by uh, climate change. And the reality is that we are continuing to build because of our increased population and uh, you know, um, increase in economic uh, uh, development throughout the world, we are building a lot of uh, buildings and, and other infrastructure. 6.13 billion square meters of buildings are constructed every year. And that uh, emits over 3.7 billion metric tons of CO2 each year. Now, uh, as I think most of you know, carbon emissions from buildings comes from two sources, one embodied. Those are all the building materials that are used in constructing buildings, but and also the operational emissions, right? So as you're operating a building, you're obviously cooling and heating, lighting, and operating the building. And, and there are carbon emissions from those um, uh, operations as well. So, uh, but in the end, because we're building so much, embodied carbon is important. We have to make sure that we reduce embodied carbon. I know all of you, most of you out there, architects are designing buildings to be as low uh, energy or uh, have high energy efficiency um, and, and therefore lowering operational carbon. Now let's see if we can't lower embodied carbon as well. The challenge is that these building materials uh, such as uh, you know, concrete, iron, steel, wood, and so forth uh, actually emit a significant amount of uh, carbon uh, emissions during the manufacturing process, hence called embodied carbon total is about 11% of all the uh, carbon emissions uh, throughout the, the world. Now, because of climate change, likely we're gonna continue to need to build uh, robust, uh, resilient buildings and infrastructure. And that means likely we're gonna use a significant amount of concrete. So how can we continue to use, take all the benefits of concrete and still minimize environmental impact? That's the challenge that we're gonna to try to talk about today. So the solutions are really concrete innovations. Uh, we'll get into details of every one of these topics here. Uh, I'll do the first part and then Don will do the second part. And uh, we're gonna talk about things like more efficient concrete mixtures, admixtures and blended cement, supplementary cementing materials, carbon capture technologies, and other high performance concrete technologies that we can use to improve performance, increase durability, increase resilience and reduce embodied carbon. So what do these two buildings have in common? The Jubilee Church and the Pantheon. Well, both of them are places of worship and both of them are in Rome. But 
for, for this webinar, really we're talking about the fact that they both used innovative concrete solutions. Of course, back in 27 BC, when the Pantheon was built, they were using Roman concrete, which was innovative at the time, volcanic ash, aggregate rock, crushed tile, brick, uh, you name it. They were using it to make concrete and buildings like the Pantheon. The Jubilee Church that was completed in 2003, well, that used different uh, concrete, uh, still used the basic concepts of modern concrete, but they used photo photocatalytic concrete that is uh, self-cleaning. We'll get more into that later. When you look at uh, modern concrete, it really was invented. The Portland cement, which is the main ingredient in concrete, was invented in 1824. Uh, you add that Portland cement to quarried aggregate and water, and you get concrete. Now, concrete's been around for a long time in this current form, and maybe it's not always synonymous with innovation, but really uh, the reality of it is that most concrete today uses some form of innovation. Let's get into the first one, which is supplementary cementing materials. Not all concrete has SCMs, but uh, most of concrete does. What is a supplementary cementing material? Well, it's either in, in, in two categories, uh, pozzolan, which is made up of either fly ash or some natural pozzolans, including volcanic ash and silica fume. I'll get into some of the detail in a minute. But it's uh, typically a siliceous or siliceous or siliceous and aluminous material with little or no cementitious value, but with moisture reacts with some of the byproducts of cement hydration uh, in a fine because it's in a fine form uh, to to make more. Uh, hydration products. Uh, I'll get into that in a second uh, to harden concrete. There's also slag cement, which is also a supplementary cementing material. It doesn't, it has a latent hydraulic material so, uh, so that it does actually harden with, uh, in water. It does uh, form uh, a hardened product and it has some a minimal pozzolanic behavior. Now, this is the hardest part of this webinar which shows some basic chemistry, um, but it goes to show how these materials work. So when you, when you combine Portland, Portland cement as a hydraulic cement, basically when you add water to it, it hardens into two basic chemicals. There are many others, but the two basic chemicals are CSH or calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide. The CSH is what really uh, makes concrete and gives uh, you know, concrete, it's hardened properties. The CH is just a byproduct, not very useful. But when you combine it with a pozzolan, like fly ash or silica fume or any no other natural pozzolan uh, or man-made pozzolan for that matter, and you, and you combine it with that CH, it, can, it creates more CSH. That's pretty amazing. And, and we'll get into the fact that, you know, fly ash is a, basically a waste byproduct of another industry. Most of these uh, supplementary cementing materials are. Now slag, on the other hand, when you add water, uh, it needs a, an alkali lime activator, which cement does provide, and it creates more calcium silicate hydrate and no calcium hydroxide. Uh, but slag plus calcium hydroxide that's already in the cement um, or in the concrete at that point, uh, creates more CSH. So you see how these products work basically um, by combining them with Portland cement it creates more of the good stuff, CSH. Let's talk about fly ash for a second. It's a pozzolanic material. Basically, it's a byproduct of the, the ash that's created when you burn coal in a power plant or any other uh, facility, but most of it is gotten from power plants. And when you combine it with Portland cement and water, you get improved strength and durability of the concrete. You get typically lower heat of hydration, which is always a good thing. And, uh, and some of the negatives may be that it retards set of concrete. Sometimes it's necessary and you want to use that quality, but a lot of times uh, that's not the case uh, and you have to deal with it in some way. Uh, basically just eventually you get concrete that's even stronger than you would normally at 28 days, but it may take a little longer to get to that.
Now, what's really interesting is that uh, because our power system now is moving more towards renewables, there are fewer and fewer coal power plants that are in operation. Some of them are uh, being uh, you know, brought offline, become, becoming obsolete. But the fact is we've been burning coal for almost 100 years as a, as a nation. And for the first you know, 50 years of that or, or even more, uh, we weren't using much of that ash for anything, uh, basically landfilling it, fill, filling all of it. And there's an estimate that uh, we have over 1.5, maybe even 2 billion tons of coal ash in landfills. Now, uh, just to give you an idea, put a, put a number on that, we only use about, um, well, if I remember right, uh, 14 or so uh, million tons of coal ash a year, or fly ash a year. And, and there are some other coal ashes that are used for other, um, uh, other products and processes. Now, some of that ash in the ground is fly ash and several of the coal ash or the fly ash manufacturers and distributors are now uh, treating that landfill. Basically, they're mining that fly ash and treating it in a process called beneficiation to meet construction standards by reducing the amount of unburned carbon that's in the fly ash, reducing the amount of ammonia in, in the fly ash, and then also adjusting particle size by uh, you know, grinding the uh, this uh, waste byproduct. So that's that's exciting, you know, because uh, the fact is we have this incredible resource. Even if all the coal power plants go offline, which I think everyone agrees is sort of a uh, a goal of if, if we want to have all renewable energy, we still have this reserve that could last over a hundred years of of this uh, this byproduct. Now, you know, it's not going to be as cost effective as it is today. And there's gonna be some energy that's required to do some of the beneficiation. For the most part, it, it's a, a really valuable product that we need to take advantage of. Next, I'm gonna talk about slag cement. This is the second most available material that's used as a SEM in concrete. It's basically uh, uh, made by quenching molten iron slag. That's the material that comes to the top uh, of, uh, during a, a blast furnace process for making steel. And uh, it's quenched very quickly with water and it produces a glassy granular product that is then ground into a fine powder. Uh, when you combine it with cement, you know, Portland cement in concrete, it protects against sulfate and chloride attack. It lowers the heat of titration. It produces a much whiter and brighter concrete. It usually re uh, results in less permeable concrete uh, higher strength concrete, but it also retards the set just like fly ash. So it takes a little longer to get to that ultimate strength. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about silica fume or microsilica, which is an ultra fine powder, a byproduct of producing silicon metals or ferrosilicone alloys, which is a, it's, it's almost, a, it's super fine, uh, finer than the other SCMs. Uh, basically, it's the smoke that's produced uh, from that. Um, that process, my, one micron in diameter, approximately 100 times smaller than the average cement particle. And it reacts with CH to produce more CSH, just like fly ash. And it produces a very dense concrete, decreases permeability and improves durability and, and, and drastically increases strength. So, but it's also the, the rarest of the um, uh, SCMs. So it's usually used in combination with slag or fly ash to produce much higher strength concrete. So you're going to see in high rises, you know, the vertical elements, columns and shear walls and so forth that require much higher strengths near the bottom of those structures will use silica fume in combination with slag sometimes and Portland cement uh, to get that much higher strength or it's used in things like bridge decks or parking decks uh, to get much more uh, dense concrete to reduce um, corrosion, uh, infiltration of uh, you know, the icing chemicals. The next solution I'm gonna talk about uh, are blended cements. So blended cements are uh, cements that combine Portland cement with other products and basically uh, you know, the supplementary cement materials I talked about 
But probably the most common is what's called Portland limestone cement, where you take Portland cement and you combine it with round limestone uh, that's usually gotten right from the quarry where the cement is made. And you grind it up finely, then you uh, intermix it with Portland cement at rates of up between five and 15%. And you get a Portland, you get a cement that performs almost identically to Portland cement. Um, and sometimes even better, and you can still treat it almost exactly like Portland cement, add uh, pozzolans and, and slag cement to it, just like you would normally uh, at a concrete plant. There's also a couple of other different kinds of blended cements. One is called Portland lag cement, Portland slag cement, and the other one's called Portland pozzolan cement, where typically you combine a uh, fly ash with Portland cement. There's also ternary blended cements with some limitations on the amounts of different materials that you can uh, combine with Portland cement. If you, uh, the, the most common ASTM standard is ASTM C595. So if you take anything away from this webinar, I would say go back to your spec writer or if you're the one who reviews specifications and make sure that you permit the use of not only Portland cement, ASTM C150, but also ASTM C595 and uh, consider also ASTM C1157, which is another more broad um, standard for these blended type cements called hydraulic cements, uh, but it's all performance oriented uh, specifications for those. But yeah, take, if you take anything away from this webinar, go back, take a look at your specs and make sure that you commit those three standards for uh, cement in concrete. Next, I'm gonna talk about admixtures. Almost Every concrete today uses some sort of an admixture. Probably the most common are, are uh, what's called water reducing admixtures. These decrease the water demand. So uh, it's a long story really on how one designs a concrete mixture, but it really is based on the aggregates that you're using and you need a certain amount of water in that paste uh, combined to make it workable. And uh, if you can reduce the amount of water uh, that you need to make that concrete workable, then you also reduce the cement demand, right? So uh, it just becomes a more efficient mixture when you use a water reducing admixtures. Very, uh, and, and uh, of course it comes by different names. You know, that you have a standard water reducing admixture, but then you also have high range water reducing admixtures, sometimes, sometimes called super plasticizers, basically makes concrete more flowable with less water, right? So that's what, and, and because of that, you need, you can use less cement. But you also have viscosity modifying admixtures and set accelerating admixtures that can sometimes offset uh, some of the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the mixes that have high supplementary cementing materials that have, you know, the retarding uh, quality to them. So you can accelerate the, the set time and curing time for uh, those concretes by using set uh, accelerating admixtures. And there are all sorts of other different admixtures that are used, shrinkage reducing admixtures and so forth that, that can add uh, qualities to the concrete that are uh, important to the final design. And oftentimes, and, and uh, more often than, than not, it's really to affect the workability of uh, the concrete. And uh, this is my final topic before I hand it off to Don, which is this idea of just simply more efficient concrete mixtures. Let's talk about cement for a second. Cement is an incredibly valuable product. It's expensive to make, even though it's one of the most economical um, materials on the planet, but it's expensive to make. It takes a lot of energy to make it. Uh, and so it's super valuable. You know, it's basically, it's built society, right? Every one of our homes probably has concrete foundations and maybe even some concrete superstructure. Every one of our buildings, uh, and bridges and roads and everything else uh, uses concrete in some way. So we just can't waste this incredibly valuable material. And by being more efficient in, in the mixture design, by basically optimizing the cement content in concrete, you can actually lower the embodied carbon of concrete by doing that. We suggest using what's called performance-based specifications, which we talked about in the last webinar, and you can still watch it uh, on the AIA 
California website on specifying sustainable concrete. The idea behind performance-based specifications that, is that you simply uh, don't provide limits on the materials and quantities uh, of the concrete mixtures. Basically rely on standards that have been developed by experts in the industry uh, to uh, place limits on those materials. There are some limits in the standards, but there's no need to provide additional artificial limits in the specification. So oftentimes we'll see maximum cement contents or minimum cement contents, maximum fly, you know, SCM contents, fly ash slag or minimum cement contents, you know, the limitations on what admixtures can be used and so forth. And we're saying, wait a minute now, standards take care of all of that for you. We also say uh, that we should have qualified uh, producers who can work with contractors to meet your needs, right? So architects, engineers, owners all have certain performance needs for the concrete, whether it's strength or durability or flowability or you know, set time and so forth. You need to be a qualified producer to be able to make those, um, those concrete. So we're suggesting that you, know, you specify an RMCA sort of qualified plants and technicians. And we also, concrete is very sensitive to testing. So if you don't have qualified laboratories or testing uh, technicians on a project, uh, they can basically drive up cement demand. Again, this is a whole, whole course, but uh, basically how you overcome testing that's not done to standard, uh, because what typically happens is you get strengths that are below specified strengths. And to overcome that, you have to add cement to make the concrete stronger. And so, um, you know, if, if testing is done correctly, then you can be way more efficient in uh, your mixed designs. Uh, you see on the screen here, the guide to improving specifications for ready mix concrete. Uh, you can get that off of our website. And uh, I would suggest that you do it. And uh, Don is actually gonna talk about how we can even work with you to help improve your specification. Uh, finally, a, a case study, and we have several case studies in this presentation. Uh, this one is, happens to be 102 Ravonia Road. This is a, a project in South Africa that uh, met the, the highest level of green standards. And they used almost every one of these innovations that I've talked about so far. Um, and, and they were able to demonstrate that they had a project that was 50% more sustainable than the average office building using uh, a high volume of fly ash to reduce the overall carbon footprint of the concrete by 30%. So you can get the idea that uh, you know, all of these technologies or innovations can add up to a significant amount of reduction in embodied carbon footprint. And when you combine more of them, and you're gonna hear some from Don here, when you combine all of these, you definitely can reduce carbon footprint significantly and even have a, a higher performing concrete as a result. So with that, I'd like to pass it off to Don. Great, thank you, Lionel. And thanks to everyone for joining us today, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm gonna cover the uh, last two solutions that we wanted to talk about, the last two bullet points. And I'll start with the carbon capture technologies. This is something we're really excited about as an industry. It's based around the idea that through the process called carbonation, uh, carbon dioxide is able to penetrate the surface of hardened concrete and chemically react with cement hydration products to form carbonates. Um, it's a process that's essentially reversing um, the process called calcination. When Portland cement is manufactured, uh, limestone is combined with a variety of materials heated to high temperature. And in that process of converting that limestone into what is called clinker, which is then combined with gypsum to create Portland cement, that chemical process releases carbon dioxide, which then um, accounts for the majority of the embodied carbon footprint of ready mix concrete. So through this carbonation process, it's kind of a natural way that um, the limestone components within the um, uh, ready mix concrete is trying to convert back to its uh, um, uh, carbon uh, origins. 
So for in-service concrete, this process is very slow, but given enough time and under ideal conditions, um, you're able to, you would theoretically be able to convert all of the CO2 uh, released during that calcining process, you'd be able to convert it all back into that uh, limestone mineral within the uh, concrete. What's important to keep in mind is when CO2 is absorbed by concrete, it is permanently mineralized. So it can never be re-released back into the environment. So it's, it really offers a permanent solution for the CO2 that is absorbed by the ready mix concrete. Now this uptake is greatest when the surface to volume ratio is high. And um, it's interesting that at the end of concrete's useful life, very little of it is sent to landfill. It's just too heavy, too bulky, too expensive. So it's oftentimes ground up um, and then uh, reused in other applications. And by grinding it up, you're creating uh, you're optimizing the surface area of the uh, concrete. And so now um, at end of life, you're really optimizing the ability of that uh, concrete to absorb CO2 over a shorter period. And ideally, if that crushed concrete could be left exposed to air for one or two years before reuse, you'd really be enhancing this natural um, uh, carbonation capability. Uh, there was a study done, it was released in 2015, and it looked at the um, estimated uptake of CO2 in concrete put in place, hardened concrete put in place throughout the world from the period of 1930 to 2013. And the results of the study estimated that 4.5 gigatons of cumulative sequestered carbon was absorbed by all concrete put in place during that time frame, which was enough to offset 43% of the CO2 emissions from the production of cement. Now this really represents a, a, a game changing development for our industry and our industry continues to investigate ways of quantifying this as accurately as possible to better inform uh, green building rating systems, et cetera, as to the true uh, embodied carbon footprint of ready mix concrete. So there are a number of entrepreneurs that have taken this natural carbonation process and incorporated it into different manufacturing processes for uh, creating ready mix concrete or other types of concrete products. So for example, here's a product or a, a um, development that is uh, available in the marketplace right now. There's over a hundred of installations of a technology that allows for the injection of purified liquefied CO2 into ready mix concrete during the mixing operation. In doing that, you're sequestering a small amount of the CO2 that's actually injected into the concrete. Uh, in addition, the concrete that's being manufactured, the uh, compressive strength is enhanced through the introduction of that CO2, which allows you to reduce the amount of Portland cement introduced into that concrete mix, which would further reduce the embodied carbon footprint. Like I said, there's over 100 examples or installations of this technology available throughout the country. So this is a uh, technology that's readily available um, uh, throughout the country. Here's an example of a project that was done using this type of technology. Uh, it's a 360,000 square foot office building done in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it consumed 48,000 cubic yards of this carbonated concrete, which uh, was responsible for sequestering or permanently mineralizing 680 metric tons of CO2, equivalent to the amount of CO2 absorbed by 800 acres of forestry in one year. A second example of this enhanced carbonation process is um, taking specially formulated cement. And when this cement is manufactured, the originators of this process uh, use um, kilns that are fired at lower temperatures and they claim there's significantly less limestone used as well as uh, uh, fewer CO2 emissions and overall uh, a 30% reduction in the greenhouse gases 
um, produced when the cement is actually manufactured. And then you take that specially formulated cement and you manufacture uh, different types of, of concrete products. In this example, you see uh, precast concrete floor planks being manufactured. And so they're made with this specially formulated cement and then they're taken into curing chambers that are CO2 uh, rich curing chambers so that they're able to absorb additional CO2 uh, in the curing process. And uh, the developers of this process claim that um, there's about 5% of equivalent to 5% of the weight of the concrete material in sequestered CO2 uh, through this process. And overall, they claim that the concrete produced in this process has a embodied carbon footprint reduced by 70%. Um, there are uh, efforts being made to introduce this process into ready mix concrete, but currently uh, there's um, market viability for the use of this technology for precast applications. Here's a third enhanced carbonation process. Now this is not yet market viable, but uh, we're hoping and we're very excited about this process uh, coming to market um, sooner rather than later. It involves the ability to create synthetic limestone. And the developers of this process use a, a, a proprietary bath that's been seeded with uh, small rock or recycled concrete particles. And then through this process, uh, unpurified um, CO2 uh, harvested from various industrial processes are injected into this proprietary bath and it causes artificial limestone to grow over these seed particles to create artificial limestone to replace natural limestone mined in quarries. So now you have this artificial aggregate that can be used for ready mix concrete manufactured from permanently mineralized CO2. The developers of this process claim that carbon negative concrete is possible. So they provide this example where if you had uh, a cubic yard of concrete and it contained 3000 pounds of these um, artificial aggregates, 44% of the weight of those aggregates would be sequestered CO2, which would be equivalent to about 1300 or over 1300 pounds of permanently mineralized CO2 material, which would more than offset the CO2 generated in the uh, Portland cement that would be incorporated in um, a, a cubic yard of concrete at about 600 pounds. So you can see we're, we're uh, more than offsetting, we're doubling the amount of CO2 that's, that's uh, being uh, sequestered in this cubic yard of concrete, um, making carbon negative concrete a possibility. So this is really an exciting development. So let's move from carbon capture technologies to high performance concretes. Let's talk about bendable concrete. This is a concrete where very tiny fibers are dispersed throughout a, a concrete mix. And um, these small fibers, which are generally polymer derived um, are dispersed throughout the mix and greatly increase the ductility, uh, providing 300 to 500 times more tensile strain capacity than normal concrete. So now you have a concrete that um, can handle um, repetitive loading very effectively. So applications for this type of concrete would include paved surfaces with repeated heavy loading, uh, things like Vidoc dampers, or uh, incorporating this material into portions of uh, seismic foundations for large scale projects in earthquake prone regions. So in addition to the um, tremendous um, uh, structural capabilities of the material, it also has self healing capabilities as well. Um, the fibers dispersed throughout the mix uh, keep surface cracks very small and then um, those cracks that do occur in the presence of moisture, uh, latent leftover uh, cementitious material is able to combine with that moisture to kind of mineralize and seal those 
uh, cracks effectively. So the material is able to uh, maintain a, a very durable um, uh, exterior surface. We also have ultra high performance concretes, the UHPCs. In this case, you have a premix of cement powder of fibers and admixtures. Um, the fibers can be high carbon metallic, stainless, polyvinyl, alcohol, or glass fibers. Uh, the fibers serve to improve the strength and ductility of the uh, concrete mix itself. Uh, also improves the uh, durability of the concrete, making it less porous, more resistant to various uh, chemicals, and also imparts a similar self-healing capability like we just described with the bendable concrete. Here's a case study, the Perez Art Museum in Miami. Um, this is a facility built on Biscayne Bay, uh, an area subjected to high quantities of, of uh, sea air and salt, so very kind of caustic environment, and also uh, subjected to the risk of tropical storms and hurricanes. So for this project, there was a need for um, uh, creating uh, expansive views out from the facility, and yet they had to keep in mind that they needed to uh, respond to uh, Florida hurricane resistance, uh, building code requirements for hurricane resistance, and by using UHPC to create 116 foot long uh, slender mullions that could be incorporated into uh, glazing, um, they were able to produce the world's largest impact resistant window, which is reinforced by this uh, uh, specialized concrete, uh, very thin mullions to maximize visibility by still meeting uh, building code requirements. Now, those are two examples of very specialized fiber reinforced concrete. Overall, fiber reinforced concrete has been around for a long time. It's really not a new product. Um, there have been a lot of improvements over time uh, related to strength and durability of, of various types of fibers and, and uh, concrete mixes with these products. Uh, so you see fibers made of steel, glass, and plastics. The plastic fibers primarily used for combating plastic and drying shrinkage cracking, but we're seeing more and more sophisticated fibers that can be used in place of traditional steel reinforcement to reduce or eliminate um, some of the, the uh, reinforcing, which helps to save time and labor on job sites. So here's a case study of a project that was done with insulating concrete forms. And you see, if you're not familiar with ICFs, the lower um, illustration just shows the stay in place forming system that typically consists of two layers of polystyrene foam, insulated foam, one on each side of a concrete cavity, a reinforced concrete cavity. And then you see the uh, black elements. Um, those are uh, ties that hold the foam layers to require distance apart to create the concrete core. Um, and they extend almost to the exterior face of the foam to create uh, continuous furring strips that run vertically um, uh, just below the surface of the foam. So now you're able to attach finishes directly to these, these blocks um, for, in this case, um, um, uh, brick veneer on the exterior of this project and drywall on the interior, but virtually any type of finish can be mechanically fastened to this stay in place uh, forming assembly. So this was the technology used. The difference with this project is the blocks were panelized. They were combined off-site to create larger panels up to 50 feet long with the windows and door openings incorporated into the panels. Uh, the full complement of traditional reinforcement was still used around the openings, but all horizontal rebar was eliminated from these panels. And that's important from a panelization perspective because when you bring out these panels, you butt them together end to end, um, having horizontal rebar um, across those um, joints between panels become problematic because it's difficult to get the, the splices that you need and effectively um, um, tie your, your rebar and organize your rebar at those, at those seams. So in this case, by going to helical steel fiber, all of the horizontal reinforcement is eliminated 
which simplifies the panelization. Once the panels are placed, then vertical reinforcement can be inserted down into the panels and then the um, um, fiber reinforced concrete can be placed to complete the installation. Saves on labor and time on the site. The owner can occupy the building more quickly. Um, and overall, um, interesting innovation that's actually seeing uh, use in the field. Here's an interesting product, geopolymer concrete. Instead of uh, Portland cement, this is concrete using uh, supplementary cementitious materials, fly ash and or slag, and chemical activators to form the hardened binder to replace that Portland cement binder with a, a different type of hardened binder that will um, hold all of the aggregates and constituent ingredients of concrete together. The activators are typically sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. What's holding this product back from the marketplace is um, the expense of these activators, as well as um, a lot of care being necessary in their handling. They're very caustic, so you have to be very careful with them. What's interesting is um, the use of geopolymer, or the, the characteristics of geopolymer create concrete with similar or even uh, opti more optim optimized um, um, characteristics than conventional Portland cement with faster strength gains, lower drying shrinkage, lower heat of hydration, uh, improved durability with greater chemical resistance, and even uh, further optimizing uh, fire resistant qualities over and above traditional Portland cement concrete. Uh, here's an example of a project that actually used geopolymer concrete. Um, you can see the lower photograph shows uh, precast elements that were made with the geopolymer concrete that was used to create um, uh, the second floor floor and create a decorative ceiling at the first floor of this facility. Um, the whole um, strategy of this project was to significantly reduce the carbon footprint of, of the various construction materials used on the project so it could qualify as a living building challenge project and was Australia's first carbon neutral building. Uh, one last thing about geopolymer concrete, there have been advances at Rice University. Um, they have been able to reduce the amounts of that expensive and uh, hazardous activator which uh, we're excited about because uh, reducing the amount of activator uh, will certainly help to improve the handling of, of the material and make it more uh, useful. So um, that's an exciting development with, uh, with this material. You have graphene concrete. Graphene is a very thin material that's uh, as thick as a single layer of carbon atoms. Um, it's derived from graphite, commonly used in pencils and lubricants. It offers strength 100 times greater than steel. Um, for a concrete application, you take the um, graphene uh, as flakes and mix it with mixing the mixing water for the concrete. Um, to uh, uh, create this uh, um, um, graphene reinforced concrete, inexpensive, compatible with current large scale manufacturing for, for ready mix concrete, uh, greatly improves strength and durability or permeability, and it helps to reduce the amount of cement needed for the concrete to um, uh, further reduce the embodied footprint. Uh, going back to Rice University, they recently announced a breakthrough, uh, being able to derive uh, graphene from um, recycled tires, which um, will create another source of graphene material that uh, should enhance the uh, market viability of this product. And then you have self-consolidating concrete. Um, it's a highly flowable concrete, non-segregating. Lionel talked about admixtures and certainly the use of plasticizers, viscosity modifiers to help with the flowability of this mix is very important. It can be placed faster than regular concrete. Um, 
the challenges that we're seeing more and more are more and uh, more dramatic shapes and configurations in, in the projects that are demanding concrete. And so the um, rebar congestion is becoming uh, more and more of an issue and having this flowable concrete to, to uh, accommodate the, the rebar congestion has become very important. So here's an example, a project that at the time of its construction, the tallest residential structure in the United States when it was completed, it features a um, exposed uh, concrete frame that was done with uh, self-consolidating concrete. Um, so there was a need for a very pristine, uh, precise finish, both on the outside and then for these very expensive residential units um, the frame was exposed on the inside uh, as an interior design element. So the finish of the concrete was very important to this project. And you can imagine the rebar congestion given the height, the, the thinness and the height of this structure. It's only 94 feet wide and almost 1400 feet high. So it had a lot of heavily reinforced uh, areas. And so through the use of uh, pumpable self-consolidating concrete, a project like this was, uh, was uh, possible. And then finally, just talking about self-cleaning concrete, um, titanium dioxide is a material that can be mixed with concrete and um, titanium dioxide will react in a, um, a process activated by light, a photocatalytic process. And so when airborne pollutants like nitrous dioxide, for example, in urban environments, um, uh, the burning of fuels from cars and trucks can deposit uh, staining from nitrous dioxide on the surfaces of buildings. Um, and having this titanium dioxide, it's able to react with the nitrous dioxide and convert it uh, in this photocatalytic process to harmless nitrate salts, which are water soluble and they dissolve readily and wash away uh, from rainwater. So um, the Jubilee Church in Rome, which Lionel talked about early on in the presentation, is an example of the use of this self-cleaning photocatalytic concrete. Um, the aesthetic behind this project was to create these three shells that were meant to represent the Holy Trinity. So they're pristine, very pure appearance was very critical for the overall aesthetic. So the project was completed in 2003 and these shells have remained very clean, very white um, as this um, self cleaning concrete continues to perform this constant self maintenance. So that concludes the presentation and just in summary, uh, what is the future of concrete? Well. You know, you've seen a lot of interesting innovations, some of which have been brought to the market. We don't see one single solution necessarily. It's really going to depend on the specific requirements of, of every project. And we think there'll be the use of a combination of, of, of the variety of innovations we've shared today. Um, in particular, we're excited about carbon negative concretes, um, something that is really game changing for the industry in terms of being able to permanently mineralize and remove from the environment more CO2 than is admitted during manufacturing. So with that, that concludes the AIA portion of the presentation. I just wanna to touch on um, the Build With Strength program that Lionel and I are a part of. Um, the program is set up to offer free collaboration with design and construction teams, particularly for projects from three to seven stories. Uh, we can offer structural system recommendations. Uh, we can uh, do cost comparisons, both first cost, operating cost comparisons. Certainly we're seeing a lot of dramatic rise in competitive material costs. And certainly we can work with you if you have a project that you're seeing some uh, uh, budget pressures, we can work with you to um, put together a comparative budget to, to show you how concrete can, can bring that project in more competitively. We can offer pro also provide specification reviews um, to help optimize your specifications based on some of the things Lionel spoke to uh, regarding moving more towards a performance-based specification.
to provide more flexibility for your local concrete producer to meet the um, sustainability requirements of your project. That's our website, www.buildwithstrength.com forward slash design dash center, where you can find more information about uh, our capabilities uh, with Build With Strength. And then finally, here's our design team based all across the uh, United States. This shows nine of the 10 individuals on our team. We've just added a 10th person to help out with the, the cost estimates that uh, are part of our, our effort. Uh, here locally in California uh, on the West Coast, Patrick Matchy. You see uh, Patrick at the far left-hand side of this uh, illustration. And there's Patrick's email address and phone number. Um, so he's here as your uh, starting point for uh, working with the Build With Strength program. And so with that, I think we're ready for questions. Thanks, Dom and Lionel. There's a series of questions up in the Q&A uh, tab. There's also some in the chat. So if you guys could tackle those, hopefully got some time to, to address some of those. <laughs> Have you got access to the Q&A tab or shall I read them to you? I think it's best if you read them, Bob. All right, um, hopefully we can get through these. There's got nine of them in the Q&A and there's probably some more in the chat. So yeah, reading from the Q&A, there's a trend of over ordering by contractors due to the cost of the job site and limited costs of the return concrete. Overall, five to 10% of concrete is returned to the plant unused. Would it not be a huge contribution to reducing footprint and add profit to the bottom line when more concrete would be reused in the plastic state? Are there uh, objections, blockers to plastic reuse, uh, more concrete and less sending this to reclaimers in the dump? Uh, the sustainability contribution would be significant. Yeah, uh, I can tackle that one. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some barriers, uh, some objections, right? Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, on commercial projects, likely a spec would not permit the use, the reuse of, of, of returned concrete, let's say on another project. There are some uh, specifications that do, uh, ASTM specifications that will permit it. And there are some projects that would allow for the use of concrete. So I would say the less technical projects where, you know, uh, for example, uh, maybe a residential project that only required 3,000 PSI concrete, but you're getting return concrete that's 5,000. There's, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't batch over top of that concrete to, to make concrete that maybe is 4,000 PSI, still meets all the requirements of, of a residential project. I think it probably makes sense that um, the concrete that is returned somehow get at least permitted on certain projects over certain applications on commercial projects. <clears throat> and, and so, you know, I think it's, there's a paradigm shift there, right? So we have to work with specifiers, uh, architects, engineers like yourself to, um, to make that happen. Great. You know, we we're approaching our time limit. Let's take one more question. And then I understand you guys will address all of the, quest the questions that are in here that we don't have time to do. Looks like we've got 11 or 12. So the next question maybe as we wrap up is, is anyone aware of a hybrid concrete uh, graphene trials in North America? Um, I'll just mention, I'm not aware of one in North America. Lionel can perhaps address if, uh, that if there are. I just saw last week a trial done in Manchester in England, a gymnasium floor that was done using graphene concrete and the engineer record on the project estimated that they saved uh, 10 to 20 percent over the cost of conventional ready mix while improving the embodied carbon footprint by being able to reduce the thickness of the slab, reduce the amount of um, material overall, and reduce the amount of Portland cement in the mix itself. Great. So as we are at our, our limit of our time, uh, I do want to, uh, as I say, we'll, we'll respond to these questions in, in a follow-up. Um, but I, I really do want to thank you, uh, Lionel and Dom, and our partners at, at, at uh, Build With Strength, uh, the NRMCA, 
the CNCA and CalSEMA for this excellent presentation. If you've made it this far, uh, the AI staff will submit you for AI uh, continuing education credit. And it should appear on your transcript in a few weeks. Uh, as always, more resources and tools are found on the AIA California's website at www.aiacalifornia.org slash climate action slash. So thank you again for joining us today and we'll see you at our next climate action webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.